when it comes to the most villainous states of all time, it is hard to look past Nazi Germany, under the rule of dictator Adolf Hitler. After he was made Chancellor in January 1933, the fate of the floundering Weimar Republic was sealed, and with it came a new, brutal form of government. One of the biggest characteristics seen in the change of government led to the clamping down on minority groups. Jews were obviously the largest target of the Reich's persecution. The infamy that the regime has fostered is down to the Holocaust and the final solution they inflicted on most of Europe's Jewish population. Alas, there were other victims among the Nazis' persecution. Romani Gypsies, as an ethnic group, were virtually annihilated entirely within Germany by the Nazi death machine. Political prisoners and dissidents of the regime were also victims of the apparatus of the Gestapo, and even social deviants, predominantly homosexuals, were also persecuted by the Nazi death cult. There is one name I want to mention, and that is the name of Lily Backroff, a transgender woman who fell victim to the Nazi regime. She is only known a little bit within German-speaking circles, and a virtual unknown in any English-speaking circles. Backroff was born on August 19th, 1908, and lived in the German city of Hamburg. Backroff grew up with her grandparents, and was later adopted by her father-in-law, Joseph Habits, after he had married her mother. Liddy was seen as difficult to educate as a child, and put into an institution where she studied for a commercial apprenticeship, but she decided not to continue with that. Backroff ended up working as an office clerk, then later as a messenger boy. After all these failed ventures, Backroff became a circus dancer. The Institute of Sexual Research opened in 1919, under the guidance of Magnus Hirschfeld, was pioneering for trans matters at this time in history and were developing a lot of the early understandings of transgenderism and gender expression. He commonly worked with people referred to as transvestites, which is usually a term reserved for cross-dressers, but of course this was the 1920s, so the language we take for granted today simply didn't exist at this point. Regardless, their work was ahead of its time. The trans woman, Lily Elbe, originally a painter from Denmark, moved to Germany in 1930 to undergo sexual reassignment surgery. This procedure, back then, was far more experimental than it is today, requiring far more procedures to get right. One thing the Institute was able to offer was something called a Transvestitenschein, which translates to Transvestites Pass. This was a document recognised by the government of the day and supported by Hirschfeld. Essentially, this certificate allowed a person to cross-dress publicly and recognise their gender identity over the sex assigned at birth. It has some similarities to a gender recognition certificate today, and how someone's legal sex would be changed, and Liddy Backroff was one of these people who obtained a pass. In 1932, the then-Chancellor Franz von Papen carried out a coup to replace the Braun government in Prussia, then appointed himself as the Reich Commissioner of the state. Von Papen was a conservative Catholic who was very critical of homosexuality, and he ordered the Prussian authorities to enforce Paragraph 175, a part of the German criminal code that made homosexual acts illegal, but also criminalised bestiality, prostitution, and sexual abuse of minors. Despite von Papen's demands of enforcing Paragraph 175, the Institute remained open. However, the authorities did tend to harass the people associated with the Institute. When Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany on the 30th of January 1933, it took less than four months for the Institute to be raided. On the morning of the 6th of May 1933, the National Socialist Students League from a nearby university decided to storm the Institute, shouting Brenner Hirschfeld, which means Bern Hirschfeld. They then proceeded to assault the staff of the Institute and cause property damage. Later on the same day, the SA, the Brown Shirts, came to the Institute and started to remove all the volumes from the library to take them to a book burning event that would take take place four days later. In the evening, the Berlin police force arrived at the institution to close it down forever. Hirschfeld was not present at the raid of the Institute of Sexual Research and decided that he would enter exile by moving to France on his 56th birthday, on the 14th of May. Hirschfeld was hoping to return to Germany one day, but he passed away on his 67th birthday, on the 14th of May 1935, never to return to Berlin. Backroff worked as a sex worker in Weimar, Germany. Prostitution was illegal under paragraph 175. Backroff's life led her to commit a series of petty crimes throughout the 1920s and 1930s. At the age of 16, in 1924, Backroff was sentenced to six weeks in prison by a district court for an offence under section 176, paragraph 3 of the Criminal Code, but his sentence was later waived by the courts. Five years later, in 1929, the district court of Mannheim imposed a two-month sentence for unnatural indecency under section 175 of the Penal Code. 
In 1930, Bakroff was arrested and sentenced to two months imprisonment for stealing women's clothing from a roommate, and was sentenced to another month in prison in July that year for trespassing. In May 1931, Bakroff was sentenced to four months imprisonment for homosexual acts. During her time in and out of prison, Bacroft wrote several texts that gave an insight to her life. They were titled Freedom, The Tragedy of a Homosexual Love, An Experience as a Transvestite, and The Adventure of a Night in the Adlon Transvestite Bar. On December 1935, a seaman had lodged a complaint with the police against a prostitute for theft. The police investigation revealed that Bacroft was the main suspect in question. In January 1936, she was arrested by the police, and during the interrogation, she confessed to the crime, stating that the man did not know that I was also a male, rather that he probably presumed he was dealing with a woman. The police report also noted how Bacroft's attitudes from a young age seemed very similar to that of a stereotypical girl. In March 1936, she was sentenced to two years in prison with the loss of civil rights for three years for theft in Hamburg. This was due to the fact that the penal code was altered and now paragraph 175 covered commercial indecency as a punishable offence. After she was released from prison in January 1938, she registered a new address in a bid to escape from constant police surveillance and moved later in the city. However, she used forged documentation in order to register her new address. Therefore, she was back on the police radar yet again. On March 25, 1938, the police were tipped off that a man in women's clothing at the Comet Bar was sitting at a table with another man, and both of them were arrested. Bacroft was one of the people arrested, and in her statement to the authorities, she said she wore women's clothing out of an abnormal disposition to procedure on a homosexual basis. Her companion stated he had no idea of Bacroft's true identity and believed that he was meeting a woman. On April 2nd, she told investigating detectives about her life, stating that she received permission from the police to dress the way she did, but was also under the control of the morality police. She stated her passion for men drove her to prostitution, and that she made her living through prostitution. On April 4th, 1938, Bacroft applied for voluntary castration to be cured of my morbid passion what sent me down the path of prostitution. Her constant persecution at the hands of the state probably played an influential role in her desire to be chemically castrated. However, during her sentence for theft on August 22, 1938, the courts rejected the castration suggestions by Bacroft. In their judgement, they determined it would make it easier for her to commit criminal activities by being able to hide her genitals from any potential sexual partners. The sentence of three years was also followed up with a preventative detention order as Bacroft was deemed a dangerous habitual criminal due to previous offences. Bacroft was held in custody of the Gestapo, and she was transferred to the Bremen Oslebhausen Penitentiary in October 1938. After serving her sentence, she was sent to the detention centre in Rendsburg in October 1941. By November 1942, the Hamburg police transferred her to Mauthausen concentration camp. The camp detained many people including political prisoners such as socialists, communists, anarchists, as well as homosexuals and people of Romani origin. Post-1940, many Poles were transferred here after the successful annexation of Poland. On the morning of January 6, 1943, whilst being detained at Mauthausen, Liddy Bacroft was executed. In the city of Hamburg, there is a tile that commemorates the death of Lily Bacroft as part of a wider memorial. This project is called Stumbling Blocks. It is a project by Marta Werner and Sarah Daunhauser, working with the Hamburg state, that commemorates the victims of the Nazi regime. I've wanted to make this video for a while. Firstly, because Bacroft is just a simple unknown in many circles, and secondly, that transgender people are targets of a lot of political attacks in the present day, and so little is known about the history of trans people outside of a few historians who have actually documented it. Bacroft is a name that is virtually unknown, especially outside of any German-speaking circles, and what her story was. As accustomed to the fact, many of the archives refer to as a he, misgendering her, and even lead of her legal name, which I have deliberately chosen to ignore out of mutual respect. Bacroft is an example of a trans person who was actively persecuted and ultimately exterminated by the government of the day. Bacroft is an example of a transgender person who was victimised by the Nazi regime. 
In contemporary times, the total number of trans people who have been killed in the United States in 2021 was at an all-time record. Reliable statistics for 2022 were unavailable at the time of writing. Marquisha Lawrence, a black trans woman from Greenville, South Carolina, was fatally shot on the 4th of November 2021. She was the 45th transgender slash gender non-conforming person violently killed in the United States that year, surpassing the record of 2020 in the process. In the United States, many of these victims of violent crime are black or Latina, almost exclusively are deaths. Suicides across all racial and ethnic demographics of trans people still remains rather high in the USA. This isn't to diminish the struggles of trans people who aren't black or Hispanic, but to highlight this frighteningly unique phenomenon amongst this particular demographic. In Europe, some Russian trans women who have been unable to change their legal documentation, which requires a process for approval to do so, have been called up to fight as part of Vladimir Putin's mobilization plans. Turkey remains one of the most violent societies for trans people in Europe. Further west in Europe, gender critical feminism is rising in both France and Germany. Just this year, a transgender man was killed at a pride parade in Germany in a suspected transphobic attack. The United Kingdom, over the past few years, has seen reports of transphobic hate crimes increase by three. 332%, this is the largest increase ever recorded. It feels like almost everywhere in various ways the trans community, the global trans community, is under siege, of course to varying degrees. Naturally murder is worse than hate crimes, but hate crimes can, and usually are, violent. Politicians in many nations are condemning gender ideology, whatever the fuck that means, and in some corners of the globe, the gender critical movement is getting a lot of press. Positive press. I am self-aware enough to know that this issue isn't really a big one for people who aren't directly involved, unlike transgender people, who very much are. But I am directly involved, and so are a good chunk of my viewers. We have far more to lose, and it is important I speak up on these issues. It's important we take time to acknowledge trans people who have been victims of violent crime, acknowledge trans people who have been and currently are oppressed, facing challenges in various nations across the world. It is important to acknowledge the trans people who have been killed throughout time for being trans. This is why we must remember them.